morning, Ms. Mellon. Good morning, Ms. McCarthy. Good morning, Your Honors. Kathleen McCarthy here for Mr. Diaz. I would like to address the issue of the defendant's statement, which came in in its entirety without an objection at trial. Um, the first part of that uh, that I would like to address is the fact that the admission of that statement of the defendant allowed non-testifying witnesses to get their information in front of the jury because the trooper said that the defendant was identified as the shooter, that the defendant was in Lowell, and that the defendant was in a, the tan car which was at the scene of the shooting. I think that there is no... I take, I take it, though, that there was plenty of testimony to that effect. Were there six eyewitnesses or something? Not all of them identified um, Mr. Diaz as the shooter. How many of them did? Um, two identified him who knew him. There was also um, a witness or two witnesses that identified him as being at the scene. But those two witnesses, they were Edwin and Jose Alcantaro, they also had motives to identify Mr. Diaz because they were one-time suspects who left the area for another state after the shooting. Did and they testify at trial? Yes, those two, and they were testified and had an agreement that they would not be um, prosecuted for the <coughs> fact that they were found in possession of the gun that was the murder weapon. But, but if Excuse me one moment, sure. Ms. Mullen, clock. Mm. Sorry. Okay. That's okay. You've got extra time. Uh, oh no. <laughs> Just to follow up on that, so, the, so you've got two who identified Mr. Diaz as the shooter, two who identified him as being at the scene. I thought there were six witnesses who saw the defendant shoot the victim. Well, there were other witnesses, at, two other witnesses that were at the scene, Donna um, Graham, I believe, and Mr. Aubrey, who were at the scene and did testify to what happened, but they did not make an identification of the shooter. I would also say that um, the and there were, uh, I'm sorry, there was another car that was present at the scene, you're right, a Jeep Cherokee that rode up, and there was an individual, I believe, in that car who identified um, the defendant as a shooter. I'm sorry, I wasn't meaning to mislead the court. That so the, so the fact head. that in this, in this tape-recorded interview, the police officer said there were witnesses who identified you at the scene, uh, first of all, I take it that's, that's not really offered for the truth. It's just part of an interview. But how is that prejudicial when, in fact, there were a number of witnesses who identified the defendant. Because those witnesses, uh, it coming in that way, the unidentified phantom witnesses, I will call them, were not subject to cross-examination. And that's a very important part of a defendant's right, particularly in view of the fact, although it's easy to say these witnesses identified the defendant as the perpetrator, again, because those witnesses were under cross-examination, their identifications are not as strong as you would believe. One of the you're, witnesses... You're, you're, you're making a Crawford argument, aren't you? Yes. Okay. Well, let me ask you this, and um, I'm not sure that I'm clear on this, but the information came in the questions, not in the answer. Are the questions subject to Crawford, or is it just the answers? I would say that there's no getting around that the information that the detective actually said, and I, I can read it to you, that Detective Halford said that relative in the context of asking the defendant about whether he was at the scene or in the car, the detective said they identified him, me, meaning the defendant, as the person in the car. And this is on page 19 I, of I my brief. I understand. I remember what was said, but my question is, it, does Crawford apply? And I'm, I'm not sure of the answer. That's why I'm asking you. Does Crawford apply to the questions or only to the answers? I, I don't think it's limited at this time. Well, but I think it talks about statements by witnesses. Um, and but I don't, I don't know the answer. The, I would like to comment on that because what the detective did say was he said emphatically that the people identified him, meaning the defendant, as the person. So that is a statement. I wouldn't say that was a, a question that was put to the defendant or a question that was put to the phantom witness. What that detective is saying is that these people identified the defendant as the shooter. The, but, but if you have the opportunity when those very people are witnesses at the trial to cross-examine them, even if Crawford applies to the questions put by the police officer, 
uh, because they're part of a statement that's coming in. Wouldn't that solve your problem? If we knew that the witnesses that testified at trial were actually the witnesses that the officers were talking about when they were speaking to the defendant. I mean, the, the issue with Crawford is the problem that these witnesses are not in court testifying. There's no indication from the record who the witnesses are that the detectives are but talking since about. But there are some who come, some at least, you will admit, who come in and testify, but we don't know if those are all or the ones the officer is referring to, but then wouldn't it just be cumulative if it were an error in some way? Because some, I, some at least testify. I don't think so because of the fact that although it's easy to paint it with a brush and say, well, they identified him. One of the witnesses that identified the defendant admitted under cross-examination that he had been drinking at lunch. The two Al Contraro brothers who identified the defendant, one identified him as being the shooter. The other one apparently left the scene before the shooting took place. But they clearly had a motive to lie. They clearly had a motive to point the finger at Mr. That goes Diaz. to another issue, though. That goes, that goes to a, a different issue, not to whether the evidence is cumulative, but whether, how the strength of the evidence. Well, I think what it goes to is what can happen when somebody is subject to cross-examination and that their identifications were not as strong. So if the jury, in theory, thought, geez, you know, these identifications weren't strong, but you heard the detective say, there were witnesses, there were a number of witnesses who saw him shoot. They, in their mind, could think there's other witnesses out there that corroborate what these weaker identifying witnesses in court say. Would and I think that's the problem. I'm what sorry. do you say to your sister's argument that these references were not offered for their truth, such that the defendant's confrontation rights were not violated? If that was the case, which I don't think it was, I think there should have been a limiting instruction at a minimum. Um, I would say that they were offered for their truth, and the, the judge commented that he believed that they were offered just to have their effect on the hearer, hearer, in other words, on Mr. Diaz. Um, I think that's kind of circuitous logic because the police did believe they were true. Obviously, the defendant was under arrest at the time that they had this conversation, so they did believe that these witnesses made these statements and that they were true. They were trying to get Mr. Diaz to admit it, which he didn't. So I think that that's a stretch and kind of a backdoor way to get around the Crawford rule. Do you, well, I take it the, Im the, import of, the import of his answers was that he denied that he had done the shooting, denied that he had been on the scene when the shooting occurred, and denied that he'd, ever, that he'd been in that area for months. Yes. All right, and that was the point of, that was the government's point of getting that in because that was so inconsistent with all of the rest of the evidence and therefore was evidence of consciousness of guilt. Exactly, and that, that kind of segues into the other argument that another reason that statement should not have come in is because it was a complete denial by the defendant of his involvement. And under Commonwealth um, versus Ellis, I believe, the defendant's complete denial does not come in. There is no hearsay exception that allows the defendant's denial to come in. Um, and but, th but, the, but, the, but this is a statement which is... Um, I mean, to the extent that it goes to consciousness of guilt, it's relevant. Uh, it may be a denial, but it's a, it's a denial which, in fact, is an untrue denial and made to the police shortly after the crime, presumably as a part, uh, as an effort to distance himself and keep him from being accused. So why isn't that relevant and why doesn't it come in in that context? Because it is a complete denial, the line of cases where a defendant's statement that is a denial comes in, I would suggest to you, are situations where the defendant has changed his story um, and, and things of that effect. The problem that the court has, I believe, with having a defendant's complete denial come in is because the, a defendant's statement is usually the key item in the proof of guilt, and it's certainly overpowering evidence for the jury. Now, that being said, what, if the defendant took the stand and said that he didn't do it, that's one thing. To have his statement come in and to give the Commonwealth the opportunity to twist that statement to their advantage, to say, hey, he says he doesn't do it, but ha-ha, we're going to twist that around and call it consciousness of guilt, is exactly the reason why the court frowns upon having um, the defendant's com denial come in, Judge. And that is um, why it should not have come in in this case. If could, he could you clarify one fact for me? Sure. Uh, apparently, at one point, one witness 
uh, testified that they saw the defendant with an injured lip. Did the police also testify to that effect? I believe there was testimony. I don't know if it was the police officer, but other witnesses testified to that. Apparently what had happened um, was there was an altercation between Mr. Diaz and Mr. Ayaya, who was the, um, the victim in this case. Huh? Mr. Alaya had initiated the confrontation between Mr. Diaz and himself, and there was a fight where Mr. Alaya actually was the first aggressor and punched Mr. Diaz in the face. And that is what started this confrontation um, that led to the death of Mr. Alaya. However, I will say, I said the defendant, I didn't mean that. I would, I would suggest it was who has been identified as the perpetrator at the scene. That's what happened. Well, that's what I was trying to get to. If, if you had testimony from witnesses that there was a confrontation between the defendant and the victim, between the perpetrator yes. and the victim, and then the defendant was observed with an injured lip afterwards by uh, third parties and the police as well, doesn't that absolutely place him involved in the confrontation? Well, that observation of the lip was by the police, I'm sorry, two days later. This happened um, on the 12th, and it was two days later when he was taken to the station and interviewed. And his explanation for that lip was that he got a cut lip um, playing basketball. And he did give um, names to the extent that he knew them, street names, albeit in some situations, of the people that he was with. But he did indicate that he got his cut lip under those circumstances. As far as the sever severity of the damage to his lip, the only thing the record indicates is that it was a, a, a cut lip. But the, as, I, as I recall, again, not having read the transcripts, just the briefs, but his blood, your client's blood, was found on the car, the car that he said he was not in and anywhere near, and was also found on the gun. Isn't that correct? There was evidence. On the trigger of the the, the trigger guard. There were witnesses that said that um, the, there was a fight and there was blood on the trigger guard. But I thought the DNA, they, they found, they did testing on the, on the car or in the car, found your client's blood and also found it on the trigger mechanism of the gun that A small the amount shot. on the trigger mechanism. And what is interesting on that note is that um, the Alcantara brothers, who were again the one-time suspects, did have the defendant's shirt. And when the gun was found, the defendant's shirt was wrapped in the, um, in the gun. The Alcantara brothers admitted that the defendant had given them one of their shirts. And I would just suggest to you that what that could <coughs> lead an inference to is that the Alcantara brothers did wrap that shirt in the weapon before they discarded it. Um, in the apartment in the baby carriage where the blood was found in order to frame the defendant for the murder that they in fact committed. Well, uh, and I'm how did the defendant's blood get onto the shirt? Um, he apparently he was he had blood on his shirt after the incident and went to the and was seen according to the testimony oh, I see. You mean at the apartment. So it was after the incident. It was the shirt he was wearing. And, and you would say yes. it came from the cut lip or something like that? I'm not sure where it came from um, because the record isn't clear. The inference would, would be that even if he was, if the, if the evidence could be reasonable that he was there and got in a fight but did not kill Mr. Alaya, that he then went to a location, took his shirt off, and it was the Alcantara brothers who wrapped the gun and took it and hid the weapon. Um, and then they fled to Connecticut where and they were. And then he went and played basketball. A, a few days later. I'm, I'm not sh sure the evidence was that it was that day. In fact, there was no evidence to that other than the defendant's statement. So, so what was the defense at trial was someone else did it? It was mistaken identification. Someone else did it with a strong um, inclination that it was one of the Alcantara but was it, the was, was it essentially the defense that I was there but someone else did it or simply someone else did it and if I was there... I didn't do it. Well, the defense at trial, I would say, was more that somebody else did it. It's hard to say that, I mean, the defendant's statement came in, which they had to deal with, um, you know, being that they saw the, the fight and he had a cut lip. But the defense at trial was a little bit of a mix of both, that he didn't do it, and his statement came in that he wasn't there. Okay. So the attorney had those two issues to deal with. All right. Other errors that you point out, the jury instruction, are you pressing that? 
You say it's, uh, the judge should have instructed the jury on the excessive use of force and self-defense as a mitigation to the, murder? Yeah, well, there was, um, th that is outlined in my brief, and I'm comfortable what is in the brief. Okay, that's fine. The, the, again, the point is that the altercation started by Mr. Alaya, and at the time of the alleged shooting, there was a Jeep Cherokee that pulled up to the scene. Three or four individuals got out of that Jeep Cherokee and were in the area, and I would say it could be a reasonable inference that they were there um, to support Mr. Ayaya. So the numbers were not even. You had Mr. I, um, Mr. the individual who was involved in the fight who had been struck. His car had been um, basically there pulled over by Mr. Elias' car. Well, but isn't it inconsistent to argue self-defense when your defense is someone else did it? I don't think it has to be. I, I believe there were other, um, there was some instruction on um, manslaughter but not excessive force and self-defense. I don't think it's necessarily um, a bad idea to argue more than one argument to the jury, particularly in this type of case when much of the evidence um, that came in was obviously through the Commonwealth and not necessarily something that the defendant would accept as true, but something that the jury could certainly look at and have to go through to decide whether they believe it or not. And I would think it's a good strategy to try to put all of them to be before flipped, the jury. But it, it sounds like you're saying he was saying I didn't do it, but if I did do it, I was defending myself. I think what you have to deal with is what the jury could infer from the evidence. Um, you know, as a trial attorney, you make decisions, and based on the evidence as it came in, uh, you know, an attorney could be making the decision, well, there was a lot of evidence he didn't do it, but there's also a lot of evidence that the person did do it, was engaging in self-defense. And so the jury can certainly, I don't think those two are necessarily um, separate. I think that you have to deal with what the evidence is going to be presented to, and if the jury believes you weren't there and you didn't do it, that's one thing. If they do believe you were there, and there was an altercation, then they can go to the issue of whether it was self-defense or not. I don't think they necessarily have to be um, separated because you just don't know what the jury's going to believe. And the other issue, and I'll just speak briefly to it on that statement that was admitted, in addition to the information, um, I'll call the Crawford issue, there was a lot of other information in there that clearly should not have come in. And even the motion judge, who was also the trial judge, did state in his findings that a lot of that in information could be viewed as criminal activity. Um, some weren't, the, weren't those so minor in, in comparison? I mean, and, and also, some like, did you? Um, sell a stereo in the last few days, a car stereo. That's not a bad act by itself. If you sell a car stereo, what's wrong with that? Well, in the context of this case, when he, the, what led up to the um, altercation was that the defendant, uh, the, the, I'm sorry, the complainant or the victim was accusing the person in the tan, in the tan car of stealing the car and that the car belonged to somebody else. And then the trooper is saying, well, did you sell a car stereo in the past few days? I think that in that context, it's um, improperly incriminating, and it is inadmissible. There was also evidence about um, potential drug activity. The trooper asked the question, um, you know you're here, you know why you're here and whatnot, and he said, oh, I thought, you know, I was here for drugs. And then there was the issue of him admitting to having knives during the conversation about whether he ever had a gun, and the defendant said, no, but I've had a knife. So I just but, but as I take it, it, he described the knife it was a perfectly legal knife, lawful he, knife. It wasn't an illegal weapon. He didn't say it one way or the other. He just said, I've had knives before. And there's no knife involved in this case. There isn't. But the point being, I, I don't think there's any way to get around the fact that that statement should not have come in, that it was prejudicial. <coughs> this was a murder case. There was a lot at stake for the defendant. And it shouldn't have come in in trial it come counsel. In be because of what you say about it's a denial and, and on that line of cases. It All of those cases and the extraneous information about um, knives, drugs, and other bad, bad act. activity. Other bad acts. Okay. Right. Thank you, Ms. McCarthy. Thank you, Judge. Good morning, Ms. Langston. Good morning, Your Honor. May it please the Court, my name is Jessica Langsam. I'm an Assistant District Attorney for Middlesex, appearing on behalf of the Commonwealth. Um, I have one question that I don't really understand, if you could help me with the facts. This cut on the, on the lip, 
when um, he, he, he said something, he was asked a question about the cut on the lip before he got his Miranda rights? The, it, what happened was the defendant had been arrested in Lawrence. He was brought to the Lowell Police Station for the interview with Detective Hulcrin. Um, Detective Hulcrin and, and Trooper uh, Robert Manning of the Massachusetts State Police. They were talking with him. Trooper Hulcrin, uh, actually they weren't talking with him. The very first thing that happened is Trooper Hulcrin read him the Miranda warnings in English uh, and then asked him if he'd be more comfortable having them in Spanish. He said he would. They called for a Lowell Police Detective um, Bernard to come. They had to wait approximately an hour and a half before he showed up. During that time, while Detective Holcrim was out getting a cup of coffee for the defendant, there was a conversation between uh, Trooper Manning and the defendant, and the defendant had said what he was doing that day, and he said, oh, I, was, I slept until 11 o'clock, I was playing basketball, I got into a fight with some people at the basketball court, and somebody punched me in the lip. Was that in response to a question from the trooper, what were you doing that day? Um, it was friendly conversation, and that's how Justice Agnes had. Uh, well, it, was, it wasn't. You just told her it was in response to a question. What yes. were you doing that day? Yes, it was in response to a question, Your Honor. And, and it doesn't matter the, whether it's friendly or unfriendly. It was in response to a question. Yes, it was in response to a question. And, and the day in question was not the day of the, of the that's murder, the, right? I'm sorry was to interrupt it, was you, Was it Your the Honor. day of the murder that yes. they, they were talking about? This is what the defendant is saying he was doing the day of the murder. Ah. He said he woke up, he woke up at 11, he played basketball. He was never in Lowell. He had, hadn't been in Lowell in the past month and a half. Um, but I think, turning back to the Crawford issue, I think this is an opportunity for this court, since Crawford was issued in 2004, to clarify that Crawford uh, doesn't apply to non-hearsay, because that's what this was. This was not offered but, for but the truth of the matter. But how would the jury listening to this ever know that that was non-hearsay? I mean, how it's coming in as a statement. It's sort of of a piece. I, I just don't know how you would make that distinction. Well, the, the prosecutor never never said, in addition to the substantial evidence... It doesn't matter whether the prosecutor never said. The question is, was there limiting instruction? If a jury is listening to statements that are being made, Unless somebody tells them, the, the, you, you can't accept this for the, as for the truth, they're being offered for something else, the jury is going to understand uh, that they are being offered for the truth. That's why we have limiting instructions. The burden flips the other way. We assume that everything is coming in for the truth unless there's a limiting instruction. It's not what's in the prosecutor's head. Yes, that's, that's true, Your Honor, but I guess the point I'm trying to make is that the prosecutor never directed the jury's attention never said, in addition doesn't to matter. all this other evidence. Doesn't matter. In addition to that, before and after the tape was played, uh, Justice Agnes gave a consciousness of guilt instruction and gave the humane practice instruction. Ms. Langston, there's no question, you would agree with me that if the police officer had said to um, a, a suspect who's being friendly in conversation, or not friendly, um, Joe Citizen says that you were there and he saw you pull the trigger. And the defendant says, no, I wasn't there. I didn't pull the trigger. No question that if that comes in without a limiting instruction, that's a violation of Crawford if Joe Citizen doesn't testify. Correct? Uh, I'm sorry, Anna, could you repeat that, please? The issue was whether a question is subject to Crawford. No question, in my view, that if the police officer says, Joe Citizen said he saw you and saw you pull the gun and the answer is no and then the statement comes in without a limiting instruction right and joe citizen is not called to testify so it's not subject to cross-examination is there any question that that's a violation of crawford well at the time of the police interview, this, there's Joe Citizen is not a witness yet against the defendant. No, no, it doesn't matter whether I'm not. I'm not faulting the police officer for asking but the question. I'm asking whether the question is admissible at trial, assuming that it's not that it's being that, that it's being even if the even if the um, I mean if the if the if the defendant's suspect becomes a defendant and says, yes, that's different. Yes. But if he says no, right. no question that the content of the question, if admitted at trial without Joe's citizen, violates Crawford. Well, yes, Your Honor, I see Fine. your point. I, I'd also like to point out to the court, though, and I think that this came up on uh, with questioning from defense counsel. In United States versus Davis at footnote one, the court says that even when interrogation exists, it's the declarant's statements, not the interrogator's question, 
that the Confrontation Clause requires the court to evaluate. Here's the, pro here's the problem with that. I mean, looking at the transcript here of the tape recording, you know, the te detective says, okay, there were many people there that identified you in a picture and said that you were at the shooting. Right. That's sort of a question, sort of a statement. It's really a statement. And then the defendant responds, people said I was the shooter? You saw me in a picture? You know, that's not true. Um, so there's a statement by the police officer, you know, whether you call it a question, it's a statement that many people were there and they have identified you. Right. Um, so you're suggesting that that's a question, so it's okay that it comes in, in this context, because it's not, it doesn't violate the confrontation clause that you don't produce the witness? Well, I, I, I'm trying to understand. I think these, uh, the, the information, this came from witnesses who did testify. So even if this how did do we come know? in, how do we know that? Yes, that's the point. How do we know? So, so, so let's say the policeman has, the police officer, he or she or colleagues have said, we've got six people and in the interview of the suspect doesn't say the six people are Joe Citizen, Jane Citizen, John Citizen, and so on and so forth. It just says, I have people who've identified, what's it, several people or? Many people. Many people. Oh. Right? Ma I don't know who many is, but it's not two, and it's not four. It's right. something up above that. Right. And then how many witnesses identified him at trial? There were three witnesses who picked the defendant out from a photo array who testified to that, okay. and then there was um, Jose Alcantara who also testified that he saw the defendant shoot the victim. So we've got four. Yes, Your Honor. And the defendant's argument here is that at least three of those were severely undercut. Don't forget, we've got many who, who the jury is told, many identified you. Don't know who they are. Well, I, and, I, and the defendant's argument is if the jury is told many identify you, four, only four testify would be the argument. And of those three, I, I didn't follow, but of those three were severely undercut. Uh, you've got one plus the many. But that's not the case here, is it? it it's that there were people who identified him. That's what Detective not, not Corcoran many. said. He said people identified you, people saw you at the scene, people that's saw you in the many. car. And those, th those were true statements. I mean, many, he's many people. It, I, I, and that's, that's my one. Many people identified. I don't know. People, and actually, Your Honor, I'm not sure about undercut. Three individuals who identified the defendant from photo arrays were Mr. Ogando, Mr. No, I understand that. I'm just asking. Uh, yes. We're focusing on the validity of the admissibility of the statement without a limiting instruction. Yes. Um, uh, but was the statement admissible at all? Because why was it not a denial that should not have been admitted in the beginning? I think that the cases the defendant relies on, uh, relies on Non and Ellis, those are just simple denials where the defendant said, I wasn't there, you know, I had nothing to do with that. Difference between a simple about. denial and a complex denial. Well, Your Honor, there's a, there's a big difference. In this case, the defendant spoke with the police at length. He spoke with them all. That doesn't matter. And he continued to cr craft this story about how he was never there and he went into great That's detail. That's a denial. It's, it's not a simple denial, Your Honor. And I didn't it's say a simple denial. I'm talking about you're, you're making a... You're making a a claim between a, a simple denial versus a complex denial. Yes. It was, it was not just a denial. It was a story distancing himself from the scene of the crime, being, having, being in possession of the gun. Uh, he, uh, Are you saying we should tell police that if they say to a, to a suspect, were you there, and the suspect says no, that the police should stop questioning them? No. no of course not. So they're going to say, well, <coughs> where were you? perfectly legitimate question, and the, the witness is not going to say, well, I was there, because he's just said I wasn't there. He's going to say, I was down at the Five and Dime store. <coughs> now, you say, w well, that means it's no longer a denial, because he's now crafting a story. Well, and Your Honor, I think that the consciousness of guilt instruction, when Justice Agnes, as I mentioned, gave the jury this before, both before and after the tape was played and in the final charge. And I'd also point out to the court that in the final charge, Justice Agnes instructed the jury that questions asked are not evidence. And that final instruction was not limited to questions by the witness, it was that questions asked are not evidence. 
So with let, respect let, to whether or not- Let's assume the defendant was not there, hypothetically. That's the, you know, the defense goes into, the defendant goes into trial with a presumption of innocence, right? And he, let's just assume he wasn't there, but that five witnesses testified truthfully, in their view, before the jury, that he was there. Yes. And the jury finds him guilty. Does that mean that everything that he has said is false? No. It, it's the so if he says in response to I wasn't there, I was at you know X other place. Right. Why does that now become consciousness of guilt? The, uh, the defendant was trying to explain away, for example, his cut lip, and there was evidence introduced at trial, photographs of the defendant uh, that the police took showing that he had a cut lip. How about he was trying to explain his cut lip? He's trying to explain, he's trying to uh, explain away where there were individuals who identified him as being, who picked him out of a photo array and said that he was at the scene. And I understand that, but I'm just saying it, it's nevertheless a denial. It is a denial, Your Honor. It's a denial, but I would still argue that it, it differs from the cases the defendant relies upon, upon non and Ellis. And just turning to the issue of whether or not defense counsel was ineffective for not raising this, it uh, struck me as I was preparing for argument today. Um, this trial it took place in 2003. Crawford didn't come out until 2004. So defense counsel, at the time, Ohio versus Roberts is a law. Counsel certainly can't be um, faulted for not raising a confrontation clause no, that, 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 that is the case, but he, the defendant gets a full benefit. This is a direct appeal, and he gets a full benefit of, of Crawford. He does, Your Honor. I'm just pointing out that whether or not defense counsel would have been, certainly that wasn't the law at the time. Defense counsel wouldn't have filed a motion to suppress <coughs> these statements based on Crawford since Ohio no, versus Crawford. No, I understand, so but that's why. Um, so if your position is even if we find it was error, perhaps, not to give a limiting instruction at a minimum, or not to exclude portions of this, you say it's really not prejudicial, not harmful in light of all of the evidence at trial. Yes, Your Honor. Can we go back to that? I am very confused about the witnesses. In your brief, you say there were six witnesses that identified the defendant as the shooter. I do, Your Honor, and I, I think that I have I miscounted. There were, there were three individuals who picked the defendant out from a photo ID, Mr. Brito, Mr. Ogando, and uh, Mr. Oliva Martinez. And that's at, on the uh, September 12th, 2003 transcript, Mr. Brito um, testifies that he picked him out of photo array at page 129. All right, so, the, 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 so three witnesses pick him out of the photo array yes, as the shooter or as someone who they saw at the scene? As the shooter. Okay. In addition, uh, Jose Alcantero testified. He was one of the individuals who was in the car with the defendant, along with his brother Edwin. The defendant had picked up these two individuals um, before he was driving around, before they ran okay. into the victim. Um, Jose Alcantero also saw the defendant shoot the victim three times. Okay, so you've got four witnesses, four eyewitnesses. Yes, Your Honor. Then you had other witnesses that placed him at the scene but didn't see whether he was the shooter? There were two individuals um, who uh, defense counsel just referred to, Mr. Aubrey, who was visiting his mother at the nursing home there, and Donna Graham, who was a nurse who had, I think, a bunch of ch children in the car. She was driving by. She saw what happened. She saw a fight. They heard a shot. They drove away. Their descriptions of the individual they thought they saw uh, matched the descriptions. Uh, this person who was wearing a blue shirt, um, who was standing in a certain place with respect to the car and, and fit in with the descriptions that the uh, other witnesses had testified to, sh pointing to that person, the defendant, as the shooter. All right. Thank you. So, <laughs> maybe you s I'm sorry, just one more question on the, on the denial. Yes. And, and maybe you answered this and I missed it. Would you say that if a defendant says, you know, no, I didn't do it. No, I wasn't there. And then goes on with a with a statement about where he was, whatever. Are you saying the whole thing is admissible, or should it have been redacted in some way so that the de denials come out, or or do you think that once you go on beyond the denial, the whole statement comes in? I think that once you go on beyond the denial, the whole statement comes in, and uh, because it's a, it's a statement of. Uh, either changing your mind, showing consciousness of guilt, or crafting a different story. Well, uh, why is it a wait, different wait a story? Yeah. You, you yeah. say changing. I, I'm just saying with respect to Justice Bosford's, Bosford's question, if the defendant initially denies everything and then he says, well, actually, no, I was there, no, but no, I no, 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 But say no, no. he says, no, I wasn't there. Yes. I was in yeah. Timbuktu. I mean, you know, goes on to explain where he was, which right. wasn't there. But, but, but 
and, and it's patently false. He clearly wasn't, and you have evidence that he wasn't in Timbuktu. Right. Would you say that that, state, that part of it comes in, the whole thing comes in, or none of it comes in because it started with, I wasn't there? Well, I think that the whole thing has to come in, and that's in order for uh, the jury, too, to evaluate, I don't know, whether the voluntariness of the statements and or whether or not the jury thinks that the defendant made false statements and that that's evidence of consciousness of guilt. So I don't think that it can really be parsed that way. Um, Turning to these bad acts, I think as the court has um, pointed out, these were, uh, as Justice Agnes concluded, um, these were relatively uh, minor uh, incidents, or uh, and in particular, regarding the gun, which is maybe the most serious thing, the question whether or not the defendant ever owned a gun, there was a limiting instruction when Jose Alcantara testified that the jury could not consider evidence that the defendant had given uh, guns to Jose Alcantara on the guilt and the murder, and that was in the September 15th transcript at page 35. Um, with, it, it, but Ms. again, Langston, I, I, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I really want right. to try and understand your position. Suspect or somebody is interviewed by the police, and and Justice Botsford's hypothetical was: suspect says, "I was in Timbuktu," and then it, it, it's established at trial that he wasn't at Timbuktu. I, that I understand. Uh, suspect says I was at the five and dime store and there's no way to establish whether he was at the five and dime store because you know there's no videotaping or there's no witness there or he was whatever or, you know I was someplace um, and the Commonwealth introduces evidence not about that he wasn't there but introduces evidence that he was at the scene of the shooting and was in fact the shooter right Yes. Again, hypothetically, uh, the defendant didn't do it. I'm, I'm trying to get to the consciousness of guilt. Yes. Right? And it turns out that, um, you know, the case is powerful. Nobody's going to set it aside. I still don't understand at the moment that it is being introduced at the trial, before you have a finding by the jury that the man is guilty, why a an explanation that the defendant gives to the police, you know, when he's first apprehended or first interviewed, is consciousness of guilt if we don't yet have a finding by the jury that is inconsistent with that. But that but would apply to all consciousness of guilt evidence. There's, we haven't yet had a finding by the jury, yet the jury may consider no, but there's lots of flight as consciousness of guilt, even there's though lo there's lots of in there's lots of evidence that does show consciousness of guilt. Uh, I, I'm not going to think of high, but but where one wouldn't act in that way unless you were guilty. So, for example, uh, the fact that, um, and I don't mean to be gender, but you know, a, a, a man is washing his clothes in a washer at four o'clock in the morning. And you'd say, this is unusual behavior, consciousness of guilt. I have no problem with consciousness of guilt. I'm simply trying to, to understand your position that if a, def if a suspect gives a statement that the police think is inconsistent with what they're gonna do, not because there's anything inherently suspicious about it, that that constitutes consciousness of guilt evidence. And I'm sorry, I understand the question is then it, it, before the jury has made this determination? Well, any, any statement, you're saying you get a denial. You, you've already said it's in answer to a question of mine that if the defendant says, I wasn't there, and, and the suspect says no, that it is perfectly permissible, and I would agree with you, for the police to then say, where were you? And, and the suspect says, I was... Um, you know, washing my car. And, the, and at trial, the Commonwealth doesn't attempt to prove that he was not washing his car, but there's nothing inherently suspect about washing a car, let's say, on a Saturday afternoon at 4 o'clock. And you're saying that can come in as consciousness of guilt. Yes, it can, uh, but, and that's why the instruction is made contemporaneously to the introduction of the evidence. It was made, and here it was made 
uh, bef both before and after and, the and tape so, was played. So any statement, any statement made by a suspect after there has been a denial, any statement can come in as consciousness of guilt? Well, I, th I think that, uh, and actually not just I think, but in this case, there was a hearing before Justice Agnes um, on I, this. I, I understand. The motion limine. The, the, so I, I think the subject to, uh, uh, if there's a motion in limine, there's a, a pretrial motion and the, the court uh, makes a determination based on the evidence that, um, it, in other words, the court determined here that it wasn't a denial, that it was consciousness of guilt. Then that's then that goes before the jury. Um, I just have one question, yes. just so that I get your argument. It's that if he had said no, do you agree that wouldn't have come in? If he had said no and he stopped his story right there, I, I agree that wouldn't have come in. That would have been just that would have but been. But it's no, I whatever he said, I was somewhere else that day. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Just in closing, I just ask the court to affirm the judgment and the order denying the motion for new trial. I'd also ask this court to deny 33E uh, relief on the defense conviction on the theories of deliberate premeditation, extreme atrocity, and cruelty for the murder of Luis Ayala. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Langston.